right, so until you're 18 years old, you're considered a child. And so 16 and 17 year olds in particular struggle to get accommodation because the main responsibility falls to social services to provide that accommodation. But they are very resistant to providing that accommodation, and they consistently try and send young people to housing authorities to try and get that accommodation. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that 16, 17 year olds are very unlikely to be able to manage tenancies individually on their own, and are very likely to be kicked out because they fail to pay the rent or fail to manage their benefits properly. They then end up intentionally homeless, which mm -hmm. then in turn impacts on their future ability to access future accommodation mm -hmm. without any support, without any education mm -hmm. normally. And they see very little alternative but to end up in sort of cycles of their behaviour or all these. It's very easy to get dragged down the wrong path because they don't really know where else to turn. So what we try to do is in create a system whereby we can help young people present to social services and get the support and accommodation that they need. Um, so that's what community care law is. And once young people are actually in care, there continues often to be problems around the type of support that young people receive in care. They're sometimes not receiving the support that they need. Um, in particular, if one of my clients shows up, sorry, I'm checking my phone to see if he's texted me or not, um, there are young asylum seekers quite often who are in care of the local authority but they get different treatment um, or have particular challenges, for example, around having their age assessed by the local authority. So we also assist them in challenging that level of support from social services because we, there are problems around that. Um, what else do we do? So that's, that's sort of the different things. That's what community care law is. It's challenging social services when they're failing in their duties to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. If anyone's getting cold, let me know, because I can turn down yes. the Arctic day. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so how do you get your, do you call them clients? Clients. Um, so our clients come to us in a number of ways. Um, we have a lot of different agencies um, who contact us. Is there some statistics and things probably? Um, we get, so a lot of um, community care clients come to us through charities, um, other agencies, other organisations, schools, colleges, even sometimes social workers, youth offenders, <coughs> and workers, send us clients, um, various other support charities. We've got a partnership here with um, a local charity called New Horizons, which is a sort of, yeah, so they, they send us a lot of clients. And yeah. one of our youth advocates actually has a, goes there, I think, once a week what or once a fortnight. Every month. One, one Tuesday every month. She goes there to, to yeah. kind of meet with young people and help help them and recognise them. That's, that's how, how I found it. Found us with that. Um, so it was through that. So um, we also get referrals from other law firms, um, internet inquiries. So how many clients in a year? A lot. <laughs> but, uh, I think we had 200 and something, wasn't it? We had last year. Last year it was 326 and um, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Really done and. This year, we're already seeing a major 20% increase over, over, you know, beyond on track to get to that 329. I would say personally, as the solicitor, I would probably have about 20 to 25 clients at any one time, which is quite a large case load considering the complexity of the cases. And uh, our youth advocates who also support doing the work that we do, they have a much larger case load of about 40 or 50, no, 50 clients, I would say, um, at any one time. And then we just try and support them as much as we can with the, the people that we have. Um, to talk about education more briefly, just so you know, I think the presentation that you had um, at the last funding network meeting was about education, also it was about our, my client, Balkiza, who was um, excluded from school and was trying to challenge that exclusion. So that's the other support that we provide, is we help to challenge um, decisions to exclude children from schools and also to help children get the support they need to meet their special educational needs within schools. It's so important for children to be able to do that because so often there's, I mean, there's such, there's a, a lot of, there's an Ipsos Mori survey and there's all sorts of other statistics around the moment a young person's excluded from education, that's when they begin to feel that they're being excluded from society and if they're not in education, they, there's a kind of 50% increase in the likelihood of them being involved in offending behaviour. It's a really, really important statistic and equally, young people whose special educational needs aren't being recognised and met in school, especially children with emotional and behavioural difficulties like, um, ADHD or autism spectrum disorder, they will often be picked out as a naughty child, they then get permanently excluded from school rather than having their needs adequately met. They then end up in a situation where they're in a school with other children who are what well, they're in a people referral unit, they've been excluded, they're feeling socially excluded. And on top of that, because of the fact that they've got learning difficulties, um, especially children with autistic autism spectrum disorder, they're quite often um, quite easily they their social skills are not particularly um, to explain it, they, they, they have a tendency to imitate other behaviours to try and fit in. So, if you're surrounded in a school with children who are also behaving poorly, you're more likely to mm -hmm. kind of become behave more poorly. I had a client who was um, had autism spectrum disorder and hadn't been diagnosed yet, 
he was permanently excluded from his school um, and within a matter of weeks he started to get involved in offending behaviour and he went on a spate of, of, kind of six offences within a period of three weeks and that was just because he met a young person at the people referring unit who was his friend and they got involved in, in robberies and that sort of thing so it's just it's that it can be that quick um, Luckily, you know, we've managed to challenge the permanent exclusion and we've managed to get him the state of the special educational needs now, but it just takes that time and it takes that possibility to turn around. And if we don't do that, then you end up with a situation where they just get involved in offending behaviour. And typically, when you yeah. get the school to kind of take them back, do you get the same sort of thing there? It very much depends on the circumstances or what the young school. person It depends what the young person wants. That, yeah. I mean, the, the, what I love about the job is that it's all about what the child wants and it's all about what the child needs as well and what's best for them in the circumstances. So you can argue for the child to return to that school or you can say he shouldn't have excluded him from this school so take rid of, get rid of that exclusion but at the same time let's send him to another school, let's not send him to a pupil yeah, a fresh start. Yeah, fresh start in another yeah. school where he's going to get the support that he needs most of them. Do you represent the children in the hearing before the governor yes. as well as in the appeal? Exactly, yes. Do you ever succeed with it? <laughs> Very rarely, but occasionally we do. Yes. I've been the school governor myself. Uh, know me too. The <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it is quite a hard feat to achieve to succeed at governing body level. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've, I've done it a few times in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, the the thing that's often more successful is trying to negotiate before the governing body mm -hmm. yeah. to try and have a managed move or something like that, um, yeah. uh -huh. or to just kind of challenge the exclusion in the first place and persuade the head teacher to withdraw his decision it, yeah. to rethink it. If you end up in a governing body situation. There's only very few occasions yeah, where, you, very where, you can, yes. where you can successfully argue it. Um, mm -hmm. All the you know, situations where children are unlawfully excluded, where there isn't even a governing body meeting, and then you have to challenge yeah. that through judicial review proceedings mm -hmm. instead. Um, so that's sort of an overview of the sorts of cases we do. Um, what have we been up to in the last year? So in I just, can I just yeah. interject one yeah. thing on, your, on the topic of yeah. special educational needs? Mm -hmm. um, there's more detail on <laughs> yeah, this page. But we're one of three, one of very few, is it three? No, no, that's no. I'll talk about that in a okay, minute. Okay, great, well, the changes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about how the legal aid changes and stuff happen and right. are going to affect how our, how our services are going to be important. But I thought I'd talk about what we've done first and then talk about great, the change okay. afterwards. I wanted to talk about so how legal aid changes. need is increasing and the providers are becoming fewer, so anyway. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get there. Good. Um, so, uh, what we've been doing the last year, so this office opened in January 2012. Um, and thanks to your very generous donation, we've been able to have me now move over to this office and work in the solicitor from this office. Um, we have we start we employed a paralegal to work in our West London office to, at first, and we trained her up, and she's now a qualified solicitor, and she's working. She was a qualified solicitor before she joined. She didn't just magically become a paralegal from <laughs> solicitor over there, but she was employed actually as a paralegal. She came from the commercial sector and was looking to do a career change. So she volunteered with us for a year. Then she became a paralegal um, for six months while I trained her up. And now she's working as a solicitor in our, our West London office um, from, from there, um, do, providing support the same way that I do. Um, and we've also now got a paralegal who works with us part-time as well to, to support us um, doing our casework so that we're able to increase our capacity and take on more cases. Um, which is really amazing because it was getting very frustrating when I was just by myself here going, oh, sorry, I really want to help you, but I just can't because I've, you know, I've only got so many hours in my day. Does it need um, specialist legal help? It, yes. Um, being an education and community care solicitor is an incredibly specialised field. Um, there's very, very few of so us out there. So your average retired lawyer would be in particular. It's not um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's something where we're trying to um, train. We, I mean, I've... For example, you're asking if other lawyers can do it. Education lawyers, for example, we are. I'm training. I've actually provided training to Hogan Levels, um, and we've formed a partnership with their pro bono unit there. And they're trying to take on some cases pro bono at the moment. I'm still having to supervise it quite heavily because it's you know in the early stages. But I've kind of created a training pack. Yeah. And we're no, I'm just thinking about who I know. <laughs> so a, a lawyer who's not working. <laughs> but, but so they're not no, specialists. Yeah, no. So it's, I mean, it is a specialised area of law, and it is constantly changing. Um, I, I don't know how many have changed the law so much in the last year, I can't even begin to tell you how much it's changing, but it is um, it is quite a specialised field and it requires a fair amount of training to, to be able to run on your own, but um, I mean, we have volunteers to support us and a lot of them are sort of law students and lawyers, so it is it is possible to, to do it. Um, so that's another thing we've done is we've set up a partnership with Open Levels and trained them. And the other thing that we've got is we've now got a partnership with UCL University, which is just across the way. Um, 
I actually um, work at UCL as well as a teaching fellow there, and I teach on their Access to Justice course. And as part of what? Access to Justice course, so the Centre for Access to Justice, which has been set up there um, now to promote, kind of help children, uh, children, students really, get into careers that aren't just corporate and commercial law and trying to keep people interested in this area of law and uh, increase their commitment to, to justice. And as part of that, um, we have, uh, very luckily, we had eight students come on placement with us, volunteering and helping out and providing their time to help us increase our capacity, which is why we've been able to take on a few more cases. Um, we had them with us from January to, through to March on placement with us, um, doing some, some work with us, which has been really, really fun um, and really helpful. They've been really good at um, helping with, kind of, helping young people who who are already 18 now, but we realised when we met them that had social services done their job earlier and intervened at the appropriate time or acted legally at the time that they approached social services for their help, they would be receiving more support now, they'd be receiving what's called leaving care support. So what we've been doing with them is um, requesting these young people's records from social services in the housing department, going through them with a fine tooth comb, which is something which is quite time consuming, but which is a really useful task for students then kind of cataloguing the list of errors that social services and the local authority made, making complaints to local authorities and um, challenging them and getting them to, to change the position. So we've had our first decision back already on a complaint and we've managed to get a young person leaving care status.